Well, there's a traditional story, and the traditional story is that it begins in the 7th century. Um, it arises in um, Arabia. Muhammad um, lives in a city called Mecca, which is right in the heart of the desert, and he receives a series of revelations. And these revelations, Muslims believe, um, form the Quran, and this in turn in made the people of Arabia into Muslims. They spilled out across the Fertile Crescent and conquered a huge, vast empire. Um, and when I came to write the book, I had assumed that this was historical fact, that there would be lots of sources that I could draw on from the time of Muhammad and his near contemporaries. What I found out, and this was the big challenge, was that actually the sources for Muhammad's life are about 200 years later. Um, and so that then raises the question, to what extent is what Muslims believe about the life of Muhammad and the beginnings of Islam history? And to what extent has it been embroidered? To what extent is it sort of verging on myth? The, the book is actually not just about the beginnings of Islam. It's about how this extraordinary period, sort of 6th and 7th centuries in, in the Near East, it's like a great bubbling melting pot in which there are all kinds of ingredients. And it's out of this sort of bubbling cauldron, these various religions that we would now recognise as Judaism, as mm. Christianity, as Islam emerge. Um, and the period I'm looking at is where there is still, you know, there are, there are Jews who think that Jesus is the Messiah. There are Christians who are living like Jews. There are people who are gradually following um, new types of, of, of religion and insight that will lead them to becoming what we now recognise as Muslims. And it's really the process by which these religions form. I think that, that, that any religion and any civilization pays looking at where it comes from. Um, and invariably, the story of how something extraordinary and remarkable and enduring, how it emerges, is always amazing. And the thing is that this, this, this period, so it's sort of like the end of the ancient world, the beginning of the medieval world. It's not a period that people really know a lot about. It's not, you know, it's not the Second World War. It's not the Tudors. But it's an amazing period. Uh, any of your listeners who have, have seen or read Game of Thrones, you know, this sort of world full of strange kingdoms, people with weird names doing <laughs> depraved things to one another. That's absolutely what this is about. You know, there are there are there are kings who turn communist. There are s prostitutes who end up saints. There are um, circus performers who have their privates pecked at by geese in the <laughs> arena who then become empresses. Um, you have Christian holy men who spend 25 years standing on a pillar, their wow. legs going all ulcerous, mm. but they never move. And it's a world full of extraordinary figures like that. And so what I wanted to do was not just to um, to question and undermine and rewrite what you know, the traditions of religion, although inevitably that's partly what I've done. But it was also to bring to life what I see as being the reality, this incredibly rich, teeming, extraordinary, vivid, weird world. And I know that Mecca is at the centre of Islamic religion. And um, But I believe you suggest that there wasn't a clear link between the Prophet Muhammad and Mecca. So why do you think there's this significance to this place? Well, it's, Mecca is a real puzzle because... Um, in the traditional sources, it's cast as this sort of great centre, great pagan centre. Mm. Um, but there's absolutely no record of it at all in any contemporary source. Muhammad dies in 632, supposedly. Um, the earliest mention of Mecca isn't until 741, date that we can date. So that's over 100 years later. And even then, it's located in the deserts of Iraq, so it's it's a real puzzle. There's it, it 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 just it's very hard to find in the contemporary sources. So then you wonder, well, hmm, why might people have have wanted Mecca to be the centre of um, the place where Muhammad is supposed to have received his revelations? If you think about what the Quran is to Muslims, it's what Jesus is to Christians. It's the intrusion of God into the earthly, into the mortal realm. And you think about. Jesus, it's very important to Christians that his mother is a virgin, because if she's not a virgin, then it's possible that Jesus might be the son of a Roman centurion or something like that. Likewise, if, if Muhammad is not getting his revelations in the very heart of a desert, then it's possible that he's getting his revelations from human sources. And actually, I think that that is 
what happened. If you look at the Quran and you think of it not as um, not as revelations from God, but as a whole a wide variety of texts that have come from different times, different places, Christian sources, Jewish sources, then I think that you can see that the Quran has human origins rather than divine origins. I mentioned that it's taken you five years to do your research and, yeah. you know, for this book. What made you want to go down this five year route in the first place? Well, my big my big obsession is ancient empires. I've written a book on the Romans, written a book on the Greeks and the Persians. I've written a book on um, how uh, Christendom emerged out of the rubble of the Roman Empire in Western Europe. Um, so really, it was a sort of obvious thing to do because um, the Arab Empire, the empire that gives us Islam, emerges out of the collapse of the two great empires of antiquity, which is the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire. So um, I really wanted to know what happened to the Roman and the Persian empires. Why did they collapse and how and why did this extraordinary new civilization emerge out of it? But what I had the what I hadn't realized when I began it was just quite how not just complicated but sensitive the whole issues would be because I I hadn't fully realized how problematic some of the material would be. I understand that you also made it into a documentary. How did that go? Well, that was an amazing experience because, of course, um, it, it, it enabled me to go and visit all lots of places that otherwise I wouldn't have had access to. So um, we went to see the site of a great battle that the Arabs fought against the Romans. Um, and normally that would be absolutely off limits because it's the junction point between Israel, Syria and Jordan. So you can imagine that's an incredibly sensitive area, <laughs> it's probably one of the most sensitive areas in the entire world. So, But we met a general in the Jordanian army who was very, very keen on the battle and he gave us special permission. So that was amazing. Mm. And the other amazing thing that... Um, we did that normally non-Muslims can't do is to go into the Dome of the Rock. And the Dome of the Rock is, if you think of Jerusalem, it's that golden dome that they always show in tourist photos. And it's the first great Muslim building. It's built at the end of the 7th century, so about 60 years after the death of Muhammad. Um, and it's off limits to non-Muslims, but we got special permission to go in. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, it was it's one of the most beautiful buildings in the world. Mm. But what really gives it that electric charge is that it's a place that's it's the third holiest place in Islam mm. and it's the most holy place to Jews because it's built on the site of the old Jewish temple. So a real sense of magic to visit that.